In this video, we are going to learn how to use PID controllers. We will look at distance control as an example. Here we see a robot lined up at the start of the blue line. The end of the blue line signifies the one meter mark. In the previous video, we implemented dead reckoning using logic to make the robot travel this one meter distance. And this was the result that we achieved. We can see that in the case of logic-based control, the robot ends up way beyond the one meter mark, signified by the red dot near the end of the line. This is because the robot doesn't gradually slow down as it approaches the destination. Let's look at this next video. Here we see that the robot slows down as it approaches the one meter mark and stops much closer to the end of the line. This is the result of using PID controllers to perform distance control. We will be looking at how to do this in this video. To understand how to design a PID controller, we will look at an example for open loop control and understand what that is. We will use car driving as an example before going over to our robotics application. Then we will focus on the basics of the concept of feedback control. Again, we will look at car driving before moving on to the robotics application. And finally, we will look at what a PID is and then design a PID controller to drive the robot for a particular distance using the block available in Similec. To understand PID controllers, we first need to understand the different types of control, namely open loop and feedback control. First, we will look at an example for open loop control with car driving as our application. To drive a car, you push the accelerator pedal now, how much you push the accelerator pedal depends on how fast you would want to go. Now, we are all law-abiding citizens, so the answer to how fast is set by the speed limit on the road. This is called a reference value in control systems terminology. Now, our brain needs to process the speed limit information and decide how much to press the pedal. Imagine that you are not allowed to look at the speedometer on your dashboard but instead you are given a table that tells you the amount that you need to press the accelerator pedal to go at a prescribed speed. You feed this information to your brain and we press the pedal by just that much. This is how open loop control works. The input of the system, which in this case is the accelerator pedal, doesn't depend on the output of the system, which is the real car speed. Open loop controllers are characterized as simple to implement and they generally result in stable systems. However, it is inaccurate since it cannot handle disturbances. Imagine if the car had to drive up a ramp or on a stickier surface, a simple lookup table wouldn't work. You would need to press the accelerator harder to reach the prescribed speed. Open loop control would not be ideal in these situations. We can address these issues by implementing feedback control. But first, what is feedback control? Now, in the real world, we can look at the speedometer while driving. This is actually a closed loop system. In this scenario, we don't need the table anymore. So when we look at the speedometer, what is happening is you compare the monitored speed to what you want, which is the reference speed. This is done by finding the difference between the reference speed and the monitor speed. This is called the error. Based on the error, your brain decides how much to press the pedal. Initially, the error is not zero. Therefore, you decide to press the pedal to reach the reference speed. And this in turn influences the speed of the car. As the error gets smaller, you press on the pedal lesser and lesser. And once you get to the reference speed, you keep your foot still on the pedal to maintain your speed. So you see that feedback happens in our daily activities as well. Now, let's apply this to our example of driving a robot for a given distance. Instead of the car, we have a robot. How do we move the robots? We use motors. So instead of the accelerator pedal, we can substitute the actuator component with the motors. In the car, we are using the speedometer to measure our car speed. What should we measure for our application? Since we are trying to control distance, it's obvious that we need to measure the distance traveled by the robot. One way to do this would be to use the tick count from the encoder sensors like in the previous video. All right, so the next thing we need 
is some sort of a reference. This reference is our choice. Do we need the robot to move one meter or a half meter, etc.? Let's assume this is one meter for now. We can now calculate the error between the reference and the monitored distance, and then use a microcontroller to decide how fast our robot could go to reach that distance. So the next big question is, with our brain, we were able to figure out how much we needed to press the accelerator pedal for car driving. How will the microcontroller know how fast the robot should go? There are a few ways to do this. We have already implemented a feedback control in the previous video when we use the state flow chart to perform dead reckoning. Notice here that we are looking at the distance travel value and then based on whether it is greater than or equal to a reference value, we determine the value of the linear velocity v of the robot. This is one way to compute control output. However, in this approach, the robot travels at a constant speed, irrespective of how close or far it is from the destination. Recall that this made the robot overshoot the distance. Here is where PID control comes in. It is a technique that you can use to compute the velocity of the robot based on the input error using math. We are using robot velocity here based on our example, but really it can be used to control any process. Next, let's understand what a PID does. PID is an acronym that stands for Proportional, Integral, and Derivative. They are named because of the way in which each of them act on the input error. To understand each of these terms, we need to see how the P, I, and D react to an error signal. So let's take a sample error signal as shown here. This is from our car driving example. We see that originally the error is 50. At the first time instant, because our car is not moving, the error equals the reference speed, which is 50 in this case. Then it settles down to a non-zero value. Let's see how the P, I, and D terms react to this error. For the proportional control, we look at the error at every time instant and output a signal that is a multiplication factor of this signal. In other words, the output is proportional to the input error signal and hence the name. This means that the larger the error, the larger the correction value and vice versa. This multiplication factor is determined by the user and is called the proportional gain. Let's call it P. Note that the aim of our controller is to get the error to zero. Here, we see that the error settles to a steady value and does not seem to go to zero. To influence this behavior, we can use the integral term. To completely explain the integral term, we need to understand calculus. Let's look at an approximate explanation. Here, the output voltage is a multiplication factor of the total error in the system until that point instead of just the current error. So here we can see the yellow lines, which are errors for the current time instant, much like the proportional term. The red line is accumulation of all errors till the last time instant. When we do this, we can generate an output signal based on how much the current total error sum is. The longer our system stays far away from the reference, the more the output of the integral term is. We can see that the error has gone down to zero in this case. By how much we affect the system based on the total error depends on a user-determined value i, and this is called the integral gain. The final term is a derivative term. Whereas the proportional term acts on the current error, the derivative term acts on the rate of the change of error. The output of the derivative term is proportional to how much the error has changed between the current and the previous instant and is denoted by the yellow bars in the plot. The larger this difference between error samples, the more the output is. By how much the output changes depends on a user-determined value d, and this is called the derivative gain. Adding these three terms gives the PID controller's output. Note that based on your application, you might find just the P or the PI or the PD or even the PID controller to work best. To choose the appropriate structure, we can do simulation tests to analyze the effect of each of these terms.
Let's switch to Simulink. Let's first open the pre-built model dead reckoning plant.slx from the current folder. This model is like the model we built in the previous video where the robot tries to move forward for one meter. It has the following additions though. Instead of directly feeding wheel velocities to the simulator, now we are also including the motor physics into our model. We will talk about this motor block in a little bit. Notice that because we have added the motor physics, we also have to add the lookup tables in the simulation to convert wheel velocities to the necessary motor inputs. Let's run this model. Here we see that the robot goes beyond the reference value of one meter. This is like the video we saw earlier in the presentation, where the logic-based control overshot our one meter mark. Next, we will use a PID to bring tighter control to this process. To do this, let's go back into MATLAB and open up the motor disk control underscore start model. We will design the PID controller with a simpler model before testing it out with our simulator. This model already has some blocks that will help us build our algorithm. So let's save this model as motor disk control. For the reference distance, let's use a constant block. To add a constant block, go into the Simulink library browser and from the sources library, add a constant block to the model. This constant block will act as a reference distance of one meter. Next, from the training library, let's bring in the motor block. So let's locate the, the mobile robotics training library and drag the motor block into our model. Let's double click on this block to set up its parameters. The motor model parameter describes the physics of the motor. A good model is required to design an accurate controller. Please refer to the links in the resources section to see how to obtain a good motor model for your specific motor. For this example, we will use the motor model already developed for the VEX platform. Let's switch to MATLAB and load the MAT file. Locate the wheel motor model dot MAT file in the current folder and click and drag it into the command window to load our model. And now you can see in the workspace on the right hand side, the wheel motor model object has been created. Now this motor model has been built for the VEX motors. So let's go back into Simulink and let's specify this name in the block parameter. Specify the name as wheel motor model. Additionally, we can specify whether we would like to measure speed or position as an output of the motor. Recall that our final objective is to control the distance. So we will output the position of the motor and use that to calculate the distance traveled. This is exactly what we did with the encoder sensors in the previous video. If you are interested in position control, such as for robotic arm placement, please look at the exercises for this video. So let's go ahead and select the position option and hit OK. Now, even though the applications are different, the workflow to design a controller is similar. Now let's connect our motor model to the output of the lookup table block. Okay, now we need to calculate the distance travel. We already have this block in the model as a gain block. To convert ticks to distance, let's connect the output of the motor block to the input of this gain block. We can now use the output of this block as a reference distance to compute the error. Now computing the error is just a subtraction of the reference value and the actual measured value. Let's go into the math operations library in the Simulink library browser. And let's add a subtract block to our model. Now let's connect the inputs of the block. We know that the reference value, which is the output of our constant block, will go into the positive sign on the subtract block. And the measured value will connect to the negative sign on the subtract block. We also know that the output of the subtract block is the error, which is fed into our PID controller block. So let's locate the PID controller block from the mobile robotics training library. And let's drag it into our model. In our example, the PID will output the robot velocity V, 
we can convert this to wheel velocities using the utility block 2 omega l omega r here in the starter model already. Then we use a lookup table to convert the wheel velocities to voltages that the motor can understand. The lookup table contains the voltage versus speed characteristics for the motor and it is obtained experimentally. Now let's use a distance scope to see the reference and the measured speeds. So let's connect the output of the gain block to the measured speed and the output of the constant block to the reference speed. Now the output of the PID controller like we discussed earlier will go into the utility block. But let's also connect the output of the PID controller to the controller output scope. We will use this later for debugging purposes. Double click on the PID block to set up its parameters. In the controller drop down, we can select the type of controller. It's usually a good practice to start with just the proportional controller. So let's choose a P only controller. Here we can see the proportional gain is set to one. Let's apply these changes. And let's open up the scope blocks as well. And now let's hit the run button on the scope window. And now we can see that the reference is a step signal of one. The measured value has reached one as well. And that means our controller P was good enough to reach the desired distance. Let's see if this, if we can make this faster. Let's increase the proportional gain to five. Let's hit apply and let's run the model again. And now we see the response was much faster because it reaches one meter sooner. To analyze this further, let's look at the controller output scope. Note that the controller output in physical terms is a robot's linear velocity. At its highest value, we are asking the robot to move at five meter per second However, the robot's linear speed is restricted to how fast the motors can rotate. So let's calculate this limit in MATLAB. At the command prompt, max v is equal to wheel radius times the max angular velocity of the wheel, which is 13 radians per second for the VEX motors. And we can see that this result is 0.67. This is how fast our robot can go, which means that it cannot travel at five meters per second. So let's specify this limit in our controller. Let's go back into Simulink. And under the PID advanced tab, let's limit the output. And let's set the upper saturation limit to be 0 0.67 and the lower saturation limit to be negative 0 0.67. Let's apply these changes and let's run the model again. So now you see that the output is not a crazy number, but something that is physically possible. So to get a faster response, it seems like we must increase the gain even further. Let's go back to the main tab and let's change the proportional gain to 50. Let's hit apply and now let's run the model again. Now, do you see these extremely fast oscillations? This means that our controller is unstable because you are oscillating too much about the reference value because the gain value is too high. Imagine if you had tried this on the real robot, you might have been shopping for a new one right now. But because this was a simulation, there's no physical harm done. So let's re reduce it back to five to get a smoother control. Let's a hit apply and let's run the model again. Now this is better. In our simulation, the measured distance reaches the reference distance with just a P controller. Let's use this controller with our simulator to see how it behaves. Let's select the subtract and the PID controller block. Let's copy it. Now let's open the dead reckoning underscore plant model that we opened up earlier. Let's save this model as dead reckoning disk control. Let's delete the state flow chart and paste the PID controller and the subtract block that we copied from the earlier model. Let's connect the measured and the reference distances, just like I'm doing right here. The output of the PID is the linear velocity that we connected to the two omega L omega R block earlier. Now let's run the model. 
we see that the robot approaches the 3 meter from the 2 meters. We can also look at the distance travel scope to see that it has moved exactly 1 meter. Let's go back to the presentation and do a quick recap. After designing the PID controller, we put it in a simulator environment. We can compare the performance of the on-off control with the PID. We can see that in the on-off control, we were unable to tightly control the distance traveled. PID gives us a more accurate control of the distance traveled. Now let's look at how this controller does on the real robot. We can see the smoothest stop as it gets closer to the 1 meter mark. The robot gets close to the desired 1 meter mark but doesn't reach it. This is because the real world is much more complicated. For example, the motors have initial friction, slip, slack, etc. And the robot has some weight. We were unable to confirm this behavior in the simulation because these characteristics are currently not modeled in the simulation. So some of the gains that work in the simulation may not work on the robot. So it's a good idea to use the simulation to get close to something that works and then use the hardware trial and error to optimize for performance. In our case, this offset where the robot is unable to reach the desired value is called the steady state error. Here, no matter what proportional gain you have, the offset will always remain either overshooting or undershooting the target. At this point, it is a good idea to include an integral term. Let's go back to our smaller model, motordiskcontrol.slx. Now this is how engineering design works. We build smaller systems and then put it together with other systems to see if everything works together. Now in our case, let's change the controller structure to PI. So let's double click on the PID controller to open its parameter dialog. And let's change the controller type to PI. We will play with the integral term in the simulation to make sure that including this extra term doesn't have any negative effects on our system. Doing this in simulation first helps us catch any undesirable effects on the integral gain. Now we can specify the I gain as well. The default is one. So let's just open up the two scopes again like we did earlier. And now let's hit apply to these changes. And let's run our model again. Now we have some good and some bad news. The good news is that our output reached the reference faster. The bad news is that it goes beyond the reference and takes longer than 10 seconds to settle down. Let's look at the controller output. Here we see that it's saturated for the first few seconds. Recall that integral control works best on some of errors until the current instant. However, in scenarios like this, when the output is saturated, the integral controller exhibits an issue called windup. It keeps unnecessarily accumulating error values even while the controller is doing its best to give you a fast response. No worries, we can solve this. We just need to instruct the controller how to calculate the error during windup. In the PID parameters, let's go to the the PID advanced tab and besides the saturation terms we see a menu for an anti windup method. Let's change it from none to clamping. This will tell the integrator to stop summing errors whenever the output is saturated. Let's apply these changes and let's run the model again. Awesome! Our distance reaches the reference distance in the simulation. Now let's put this controller into our simulator environment. Let's go back into the model and copy only the PID controller block now. And let's replace it in the dis in the dead reckoning underscore disk control that we are working with. So let's delete this one and paste the new block. And now let's run this model again. We see that the robot moves a distance of one meter. Let's go back to the presentation and look at the real world. With the PI controller, we can see that the error between the final robot stop and the 1 meter mark is much smaller. This controller is better than the P only controller 
and much better off than the on-off algorithm. We were unable to see this difference in the simulation, but on the hardware, the difference is appreciable. We see here that a PI controller itself has done its job. What about D? Let's play with that. Let's go back to Simulink. Let's go into the PID controller and let's make let's change the controller type to PID. As you can see, the derivative gain default is zero. Let's make it something small like 0 0.1. Let's hit apply and now let's pull up the scopes again. And now let's run our model. We see that even the small gain has made our system unstable. This is denoted by the extremely oscillatory controller output and our final state, which you can see when I move the legend. Another reason to use simulation to test our gain values. There are a lot of times when guessing values is very difficult. No worries, simulating to the rescue. See this tune button here on the PID parameters window? Let's click this. By clicking this, Simulink will try and find what it thinks are the best set of P, I, and D parameters. So looking at the window that pops up, what we see here is a response of our system for an input signal of one unit. So in our case, given an input reference of one meter, how will our controller respond to it? We can see the tune PID parameters by going into the tuning tools and clicking on the show parameters button. We can also see that there are response characteristics that are computed here. These are classical terms in control systems design. Please refer to the resources section if you are interested in learning more about this. For example, settling time tells you how fast a controller can reach the reference speed. In this tool, you can also move the sliders here to retune the controllers. The response time slider can be used to get a faster response. So let's move to the right. But note that the overshoot becomes higher as well. This would mean our controller would move the robot beyond one meter and then correct it by bringing it back. This is not an ideal scenario. So we can use the transient slider down here to make the system more robust to reduce the overshoot. So let's move this to the right as well. Once we are happy with our response, in our case, the settling time is close to a second. Under the results tab, you can hit the update block button. And now we can go back to the PID parameters to see that these values have been updated here. Let's run our model. So now we have a controller that can reach the reference distance. In our case, we saw that the D term only affected the control of the robot negatively, resulting in jerky motions. So we went back to using a PI controller. It is important to understand that there might not be a one-to-one -one match between simulation and hardware. Simulation approximates the real world. We use it as an initial tool to quickly get started with the design process. We might have to do additional tuning of the algorithm parameters, such as the PID gains on the actual hardware by running repeated hardware tests and confirming behaviors under different scenarios. For example, in our hardware, we tested both a PID and a PI controller variation. And we saw that the PI was much more stable than the PID. Let's go back to the presentation. Let's review the PID design process. It is usually a good practice to start with just the proportional control. Once we choose a gain, we evaluate whether the error is close to zero and if the response is fast enough. We can simply look at the response to see if it passed an eye test, or we can use terms such as settling time and rise time to quantify if our controller is fast enough. Please refer to the reference links in the resources section to get more information about this. If yes, we end the process there. If not, then we keep changing the P gain to see if we get the desired result. Note that the P controller is the building block for a PID. However, it tends to result in, no, in a non-zero steady state error, which is also called the offset. We saw this in the actual robot behavior. In these cases, 
we can look at adding an integral term. After choosing an integral gain, we can evaluate for the error and response quickness. If yes, then we can stop the process. If not, then we keep tuning the gains to get the desired response. Often the PI controller will solve most of our issues. The integrator will assure us a zero steady state error. However, we need to be careful about issues like wind up that we saw during the example when the controller output saturates. But by addressing this appropriately in the controller, we could get the desired response. Finally, we can further evaluate if our responses have no overshoots and they settle fast enough. If yes, then we can stop the design process there. If not, then it means that we need to fix the overshoot issue and make the system settle faster. This is where we can look at adding the derivative term. The derivative term helps in handling quick changes in input references. However, it is also very sensitive to noise. In the real world, sensors are usually noisy, and so we need to be careful when testing the derivative term. We again verify if the final system has zero error and is fast. And if not, then we keep tuning the gains to find a stable and fast controller. The PID tuner in Simulink could help us find a good set of gains. Once we do have a stable and fast controller, we can end the process. We saw an example of open loop control with car driving and talked about the advantages and disadvantages of it. We then talked about feedback control with car driving as an example and then moved to driving the robot a given distance. We talked in detail about PIDs, what each of these terms mean and how to choose the gains, and a cheat sheet to help with the PID design process. We also confirmed using simulation that PID worked better than our previous algorithm. Finally, we also verified the PID controller on the hardware. We noted that the performance on the hardware might be a little different than the simulation since the simulation only approximates the real world and doesn't take all characteristics into consideration. Hardware trial and error tuning of parameters once we have proven the behaviors using simulation leads us towards attaining the best performance. In the next video, we will talk about an important robot navigation task, namely line following. This concludes the video.